man who has taken time to holistically give himself to the word of God has not proved it that it works. The word of God cannot fail because this is the absoluteness of his power. An open invitation to a life in the word. Because you have received the faith of Christ and you have embraced the righteousness of God through faith. Grace and peace are multiplied. That is why we lay hands on the lame and they walk. We lay hands on the blind and they see. We lay hands on the deaf and they hear. It's powerful enough to give you the answer on its first application. Arise on the wings of revelation. Align your destiny. Transform your world. This is Fenero Make Manifest with Apostle Grace Lubega.
my heart I love it We've had I love you with all my heart. I love you with everything. I love you with all my heart. I love you. With
such love and sorrow. Be all thoughts composed. Be each other. Hey, come on. Ha! 
the Lord.
Just take a few minutes and thank God. Open your spirit to receive whatever God has prepared for you this evening. Sombra Catalia Erra <laughs> Rekatataya mantala pa reba zombre ketele pa reba zombre ketele pa ya ra 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 ba zombre ketele pa esa tataya mantala ba da zandra de zopa katala pa ya ra ba zombre ketele pa e ya ma zombra ka e tala ba de zando reka sopra de garanda katala pa ya ra ba robo siere ketele maranto le bara de gasora ba siere ke si katala la ma robe ketele pa. And the leke etele ba de zambra kata Shora ra ra ba zombre kete Ropa ya talama rambra de gatalapa Ropo zika talaman talapa ya raba Rata a talaman tele ketele pa Ra ande se tele etele mo Re azuro bo o katanda talapa ya E azore basanda talapa ya ye O kerere basanda talapa Ekaromara nega zombra katalapa, reka sora bazanda la talapa, reba zombra katalapa ya rara bazombre keteleba, zore kashara rara bazombre kere bosiete, azora bata daga tolo madodo kusumbo toko to, e bata la pala katalanda talapa, e re bata la talama zombre keteleba, e zombre de ketele dodo bo zombre de kete. Aye kapara de gatole ma zombra kata Isha randa taya paya rara basanda katala Re katala mambra de gatala paya rabra de Robo zembra katala paya raba katala pa Robo soko robo bo 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 Rapa zombra katala paya rara basombra kata Re katala paya rara raba zombri ketele pa Isha rara 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 raba zombri ketele Rapa tataya kataya bo katala pa kata ho ho Etanda brode gaza rapa Ele kosi la pala tele porenda kasha la pa Remba zombre ke tele maya tala pala kotele ma Zonde ke repara de ga zombra katala pa Ere basan tata kaya bada zambra kata Repa katala mambro de ke tele payata Repo si katala pobre de ke zengete Ese ke tele payanda la pala bro de ga zanda la pa Robo si karara ba zombre ke tele pa Re katala ma ro bra de ga zanda la para de ga zom Re katala ma mro de ke tele pa ya rata I ka sombra de ga tale e kopa Heavenly Father we glorify your name We give you all the glory We give you all the praise We uphold you O God We exalt you God you ai a rapa de gazo ekele etele thank you holy spirit thank you for the miracle signs and wonders you're doing this evening you are changing us you are transforming us you're redeeming a lot lord you call barande you are reviving lord you're strengthening you are upholding you are delivering you are changing you're transforming you are revealing yourself we glorify your holy name we thank you, Lord. We thank you. We thank you. We thank you for the healings 
that are taking place. We thank you, Lord, for great deliverances. We glorify your name. We glorify your name. Come on, clap your hands to Jesus as one who knows that he has not only done, but he is about to do exceedingly, abundantly, above that which you dare to ask or think according to the working power that worketh in you mightily. Somebody shout amen. Slap three people next to you and tell them you are welcome to the presence of God. As you take your seats, come on, let's celebrate the gentlemen. They've led so well. Ay, ay, ay. Can we clap for them? Can we clap for them? My God, my God, my God, my God. Men gather is brewing. Ah, yeah, yeah. I said men gather is brewing. More than 50,000 men have confirmed attending on Saturday. Glory to God. Hallelujah. All our ministers have confirmed. Dr. Reverend Julian Kula has confirmed. Pastor Pojo Yemade from Nigeria has confirmed. My brother Johnson Oyekan is actually arriving in a few hours, I think, tonight or something. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. It's going to be epic. Tell your neighbor, it's going to be epic. Of course, we have a plethora of activities lined up at the gates. And that is why we ask all the gentlemen to come early. Because we have a lot to do in such a short time. We're going to begin with aerobics. For those of you who have not been doing fitness training for quite some time, they're going to stretch your muscles like nothing. We're going to have quizzes and brain games and performances by choir. Different artists are going to be there. We're going to have different games. We're going to have tug of war. What, what are we going to have? I hear there's going to be some target practice as well. Yeah, some of you who want to love shooting. And, and it's a lot. It's going to be games upon games upon games upon games. And, and of course, that is for the earlier session. We have also spoken with uh, Uganda Blood Transfusion Service to, to help uh, support them. So those of you who have too much blood, we shall help you take some of that to give to those who need it. Hallelujah. It's a good opportunity to contribute to humanity. So we encourage you uh, to support this noble cause. From 9 a.m., you'll be donating blood. Praise the Lord Jesus. Golden fathers, like they've told you, we need laborers, especially 50 years and above, because many young men come there and some of them want simply somebody to talk to about things they might not have an opportunity to tell us because we sometimes reach many people. And so we want to use extra hands. The, the choirs are ready. The ushers are ready. Security is ready. Who isn't ready? Even the day itself is what? Is ready, praise the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. So it's, it's going to be fun that day. We only ask men to keep time. You have nothing demanding you. You know women have demands. The hair demands. The lips demand. The hands demand. The nails demand. The shoes demand. But for a man, you just bet. What? No outstanding debt. You put on and move. Hallelujah. So we'll ask you to, to keep time. I want to take the opportunity to welcome all our international guests who are here for Men Gather. I see Muli there, the man of God. He's representing that man there and his wife are leading Manifest Kenya. Hallelujah. Please have a seat. I see the man of God, Everard, all the way from Burundi. Uh -huh. I see the man of God, Patrick, this guy. Stand up. That's the gentleman leading Rwanda. So they've come with teams. Praise the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. We have many men and women of God, bishops, evangelists, prophets, teachers. I have a wonderful friend all the way from the United States, the Apostle Bishop Reverend Stidroy Williams. Come on, wave to that man. I just met him a few days ago, but I love him already and I feel he's not going to be a stranger to this house. And, and, and I see, is that from South Africa? Come on, stand up. That couple, I don't know why he carried his wife for men gather. <laughs> you're welcome. It's good you're seated next to the apostle. Hallelujah. And all the other bishops and men of God who are here. Come on, let's give them a thunderous. 
celebration. Hallelujah. We don't take it for granted that you are with us today in Jesus' name. Bear with us. There's a little noise down there, but it's going to go down in a few. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. People in the back, have you seated? Are you seated, sorry? Wonderful. I want to bless our offerings. Heavenly Father, I thank you for the generosity of your people. Giving is an act of worship and we celebrate and express our gratitude, not only for what you have done, but the things that you're about to do. So I bless every man and woman's giving. They will see your goodness more than ever before. In Jesus' name, we have prayed and believed and all saints said, Amen. Today, I want to preach as someone I had promised to teach for quite some time. And it's going to be simply entitled, Taking the First Step of Faith. Tell your neighbor, Taking the First Step of Faith. That's the title this evening. That's the title this evening. And I'm going to begin from uh, this wonderful story that some of us, or oh, no, if you've been in the faith for quite some time, and if you don't, then I'll take some time to give us some background on this text. Moses, this wonderful man of God, has been mandated by God to go to Egypt and help uh, free the children of Israel from the hand of Pharaoh. He goes with his brother as his voice, Aaron and Miriam, and indeed, by God and a mighty deliverance, the children of Israel cross from Egypt into the wilderness of where were test stations like the scriptures have, 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 have expressed. Of course, it was supposed to be a 12-day journey as the Bible says that when the Lord delivered the children of Israel from the hand of Pharaoh, the Bible says he did not let them go through the way of the Philistines, although that was shorter. For the Bible says, let's for adventure, the people repent when they see war and return back to Egypt. So God has a working process with these individuals who are not ready to go through the land of the Philistines because they don't have enough foundation, enough tenacity, enough fortitude in their spirits to face the enemies of the Philistines. So God says, instead of losing you because of fear, because he said, list out of fear, but eventually they will turn back and return to Egypt, that place where because a man is indifferent to the person of God, he might turn back to the very bondage he came out from because of the fear of the challenges that beset him. That's a deep one. It wasn't that God was not going to deliver them from the hand of the Philistine if they had uh, made up their minds to go and face the Philistine. But God says they had not built enough character, enough uh, faith in their spirits to win the Philistine because defeating the Philistine was not according to how much armory they had, how much skill they carried in, 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 in fight. It all had to do with how much faith they were able to build. But because God saw that for the many years of being taken into slavery, they disconnected so much in their ways and patterns of worship and so they knew not even the God that was delivering them, God says, uh -uh, because of fear, these people might see this, even though it's progressive, and turn back to the bondage. Because Egypt here, in text, means bondage. It means bondage. In other words, some people, because they know not the ways of God, would find themselves on the journey of God's deliverances in places where the adversities ahead of them seem, adversaries, sorry, and adversities ahead of them seem mightier than they are able to contain, not because they are not able to contain by the God who led them through by separating the sea, but because they do not yet know that God personally and find, and I want you to note this, that instead of going through those challenges and facing those adversities as they ought, out of fear in their indifference, actually would turn back to Egypt and settle 
for the bondage of Egypt as a greater testimony than the adversities they might find on their way. Yet, in fact, it's the plan of God for them to go through those adversities because that was the shortcut for their inheritance. Do I make sense? Do I make sense? And it's almost as though every consecration that I know carries the place that demands us to prove ourselves the state of our heart and worship toward God, toward God in the process of our maturations because it's more important to God that you are ready for the elevation that he has projected for you rather than the attaining of that projection itself. It's more important to God that you know how to drive that car before he gives it to you than giving it to you. Am I making sense? And our God is a God of process and pattern. He is the God who will first get you ready to learn to drive that car. So by the time he gives you that car, it's actually a function to you because it's preposterous for a man who is in trouble and he needs the rescue of that car, but he doesn't know how to drive it because he never took time to actually learn how to drive. It's just how God works. She's praying for marriage every night, but she's she ready to keep a man? Keep. Not to marry. Keep. You get my point? Oh, Father, I shall be the head and not the tail above and not beneath. But did this brother ready to actually handle the pressures that come with the top? Oh, I want to be CEO of that organization. Do you know the demands that come with that office or you're simply looking at the rewards, the bread that it gives. Are you following what I'm saying? And in learning the ways of God, I see that there are testations that will come your way, preparing your heart for any sort or level of inheritance in life. Now, if we are touching the laws that govern inheritances, whether you want it or not, there are testations that come to check the state of your heart and the readiness, the preparedness of your heart before you enter that grace. And this is where many ministers fail, with all due respect. This is where many of us believers fail because our hearts are not actually ready. But how do you know when you don't have the right estimate of yourself? Paul speaks of this thing called the measure, the rule of the measure. And it shows or expresses the danger of a man who stretches or boasts of things without their measure. Or to accord yourself a weight that you don't actually carry in the spirit. Spiritual strength is weighed in the realm you don't see. But there is the delusion of the assumption that you can actually manage or carry what you're really not able to carry. Are you following what I'm saying? So he says in 2 Corinthians 10, 13, he says, but we will not boast of things without our measure, but according to the measure of the rule which God has distributed to us, a measure to reach even you. In other words, we are able to reach you according to the weight or the measure that is distributed to us through the revelation of God's glory operating on our lives. And without that measure on our spirits, we're not able to reach to you. If we do and try to express ourselves, even in the most well-meaning sense, we are breaking protocol. We are expressing ourselves beyond the boundaries of truth, even if our, in our most willing sense. In the Bible, haven't you met people the Bible has called busybodies? You think they were not serving God? They were serving God. But weighed against what they were doing to God, this was not a reasonable service. It was not an acceptable service. He says, so we hear that there are some which walk among you disorderly. They carry no order or principle or pattern on their lives. And therefore the Bible says, they are working not at all, but they are busybodies. Oh yes, they are lifting chairs, but they are busybodies. Oh yes, they are singing in the choir, but they are busybodies. Oh yes, they are doing evangelism, supposed, but they are busybodies. Why? Because they are not aligned to the order that God has designed. God is a God of principle and pattern. Align yourself first to understand what he has called you to do. 
and how he has called you to do it. You'll be more effective as a minister in life. Haven't you read in scripture that one day people will come to the Lord and say, but we did this for you. We did this in your name. We did this in your name. And he says, uh -uh, I never knew you. We actually didn't have the record that you were for that. You see what I'm saying? So service is not only in applying yourself to the things that touch the kingdom, but firstly understanding the heart of God touching the thing that you're serving as of whether you are assigned and mandated for that thing or not. Or else then you are exercising yourself beyond measure. Look at the man like Paul, the apostle. Paul, the apostle, was given the grace to the uncircumcised as he expresses in Galatians chapter 2. For when Peter, James, and John, which seemed to be pillars, perceived the grace which was given unto me, the grace, that was the rule of the measure, given unto me, they gave to me and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship that we, me and Barnabas, he says, should go unto the heathen. The grace on Paul is to the heathen and they unto the circumcision. So it would be wrong for Peter to try to, to go to the heathen, even though he loves the Lord. He could open the door in the house of for, for, uh, he could open the door to the heathen by the ministry he is uh, invited to in the house of Cornelius, but that's as far as he can go. This measure, this rule here, holds him accountable not to express himself beyond what God has given him or signed him to do and has to call him back to the order of Jerusalem because he has the grace to command everyone in Jerusalem. Sometimes even the things that conflict with us don't conflict with us necessarily because God is checking our heart on the journey like I gave, touching the children of Israel. But sometimes these things come to check us and, and they find us out of order because we are not actually planted where God wants us to be or doing what God wants us to do. Listen, Never be led by the, by the need of the kingdom. The kingdom might have a need, but you're not the chosen vessel for that need. Are you following what I'm saying? Perhaps you might be the person God has chosen to pray for the person chosen for that need. And that's okay. You have fulfilled your word. Do you think everybody would take the place of the Christ? You mean you just wake up and say, ah, we hear there is a prophet coming to die for the sins of the world. Lord, I am that prophet in your name. Would that work? Am I making sense? How did I even go there? I was preaching about, yeah, yeah, that's what the unction does. Back to the story. As they cross through, they go 40 years. God says, okay, let's go 40 years. But the 40 years really is to build the character for the inheritance. 38 years around Mount Seir. And that is why if I had the time to actually talk about it, there's a huge lesson. Why of the 40 years in the wilderness, 38 are around Mount Seir. They are fighting, contending, dreaming to build around the inheritance of Esau. Because Mount Seir belonged to the Edomites, which are the seed of Esau. Yet this is the seed of Jacob. At what point has the seed of Jacob carried a denigrated perception of divine purpose? Or has demeaned in vision and understanding to a place where they are ready to debase themselves in rank for an inheritance that they actually look at the Edomite inheritance and they admire it and desire to actually build a life and, 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 and raise children there. 38 years, they are comfortable. None is complaining. None is praying in the night saying, God, take us to where we really belong because not many of those, in fact, all, I might say, following Moses, actually understand the mind of God. Again, as touching inheritances, I discovered... <clears throat> That if a man is indifferent to the vision of God concerning their lives, they can actually not only settle, but even contend for where they don't belong. Settle for less. And sometimes you want to ask her, must you take over another woman's husband? <laughs> you understand? In this whole world, world, 
wide world, Luzungu, in this whole wild world, you, you can't believe God for your own. I don't intend to offend. No, I'm sorry. You, sometimes some of you find yourself in the way. And the truth knocks you. <laughs> I'm sorry, but it's the truth. Now listen. God comes to them and says, you have been around this mountain for so long. Move. It is God who told them to move. None of them desired to move. They were comfortable in what was not their inheritance. Anyway, Moses is leading them through. We know what they do. They stir, they stir him to anger. And then he, they, they want to drink. And then he smites a rock that God had spoke, told him to what? To speak to. And then God says, Aha, Moses, because you did not sanctify me in the eyes of the children of Israel, therefore you shall not bring the congregation of the land, I mean the congregation of Israel to the land that has been promised. God cuts Moses' assignment short and tells him, even though I wanted you to tell these people to Canaan, the promised land, you're not going to take them there. But I have appointed a young man. I already prepared him. He is in the process. He's in the order. He is patterned. He's principled. He's called Joshua. Joshua is going to take over. Moses is taken up a mountain and he's never seen anymore. Joshua takes over the responsibility of leading the children of Israel to the promised land. But to take them there, they also have to cross a what? A sea. Isn't that amazing? Now, this is the point where we are. Joshua chapter 3 verses 7. If you will kindly get me the New Living Translation. Those of you, can, you can read your other versions, but today I feel in my heart it's better to read the New Living Translation for easier English for some of you who, although I study in King James. The Lord told Joshua, now at that point when he had, in, when, when Joshua had taken over, God told Joshua, today I will begin to make you a great leader in the eyes of all the Israelites they will know that I am with you. The KJV says, I begin to magnify thee in the sight of all Israel, that they may know that as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. Of course, when everybody's used to Moses, everybody understands Moses, they are customs, accustomed and acclimatized to the way of Moses. It's hard for this new guy to come through and say, ah, God has called me to. So God has to do what he knows to do. He has to magnify. He will make him great before Israel. God has the ability of putting honor on you. God has the potential of announcing you. It is in the will and purposes of God to introduce you before the people he has ordained you to minister. If you're never introduced, don't get angry at whoever did. You know, you're so, I deal with people who are indifferent. Somebody is annoyed because they did not recognize them. Let me tell you. I thank God that I learned this many years ago. You can be ignored even by those who hate you. But when God has chosen to magnify you, when God has determined to make you great, regardless of your credentials, abilities, potentials, qualifications, when God says, now I am ready to magnify you, you will get to a point where even if they want to ignore you, they will not ignore you. But until that time comes, keep sharpening the saw. Somebody shout hallelujah. This is the principle that I live by. If they don't invite, I'm not yet ready or I'm not yet introduced enough. A time will come where they have no choice. Ah, maybe I'm speaking to the people in the back. 
That is why you must learn. Always yield and incline to the honor only God will give you. Never seek the honor that you will fight for. Because when you fight for honor, you're going to fight to keep it. But when God honors you, you'll never fight to preserve it. The one who anointed you will preserve the honor he has placed on your life. Somebody shout hallelujah. I would rather God honors me than me trying to fight my way to a place because I'm political enough. I am, I am cunning enough. I'm crafty enough to buy my... This, listen, I believe by this time some of you know that you're capable of inviting yourself in certain places if you wanted to. You're capable of opening certain doors if you wanted to. But sometimes you choose and say, mm -mm, let me not open it. Because the way God has designed this kind of door, it's supposed to open on its own. Hey, <laughs> hey, somebody shout amen. It's supposed to connect to my frequencies and say, ah, uh ah, -uh, somebody's coming. Don't you know that person of scripture, before you call, I will answer? Do you know what that means? Before you call, I will answer. Before you knock, the Bible says, it shall be opened. Some people walk to doors and they don't see them and recognize them and say, ah, ah, this is Alan and it opens. Somebody shout hallelujah. Others have to go to these doors and knock. Praise the Lord Jesus. God told Joshua, I will make you great among these leaders. Verses 8. Let's go back to the living translation. Give this command to the priests who carry the Ark of the Covenant when you reach the banks of the Jordan. Take a few steps into the river and stop there. Listen. So Joshua told the Israelites, come and listen to what the Lord your God says. Today, you will know that the living God is among you. He will surely drive out the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Hivites, the Perizzites, the Jigashites, the Amorites, the Jebusites, and every ites ahead of you. Look at the Ark of the Covenant, which belongs to the Lord and the whole earth, and you will lead, he will lead across Jordan River and will lead you across the Jordan River. Now, verses 12. Choose 12 men from the tribes of Israel, one from each tribe. The priests will carry the ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth. As soon as their feet, listen, as soon as their feet touch the water, the floor of the water will be cut off upstream and the river will stand up like a wall. So the people left their camp to cross the Jordan and the priests who were carrying the ark of the covenant went ahead of them. It was the harvest season and the Jordan was overflowing with banks. But as soon as the feet of the priests who were carrying the ark touched the water, at the river edge. The water above that point began backing up a great distance away at the town called Adam, which is near Zeratan. And the water below that point flowed onto the Dead Sea until the riverbed was dry. And then the people, of, uh, the people crossed over near the town of Jericho. Meanwhile, the priests who were carrying the Ark of the Lord's Covenant stood on dry ground in the middle of the riverbed as the people passed by and they waited there until the whole nation of Israel had crossed the Jordan on dry ground. Somebody say hallelujah. It's amazing. God tells this guy, I'm going to make you great. Among the people of Israel. And you'd think, like the indifferent ones, he would stand before Israel and say, now you, you've been doubting that I'm a prophet. You've been doubting that I'm an apostle. Today, God is going to prove to you that I'm the chosen man. <laughs> are you following what I'm saying? It's amazing. The chosen have wisdom. Every chosen vessel I know has the wisdom not to express certain covenants. Because not every covenant you have with God you should tell everybody. When you get to the place of the chosen you realize that there are even boundaries in what you should share concerning what God has told you touching your life. That if you don't understand this, you might go through a harder route 
to reach where God wanted you to be. Many of you might not believe this, but I know this to be true. That if Joseph had not spoken his dream to his father and the, the father and, and brothers, before his father and family, let me use the word family, before his family, there was still a way of God getting him to Egypt without necessarily going through a pit and a prison because the purposes of God stand sure from the time he commits an oracle over a man. How many of you believe it? He has given him a dream of his plan for him. Are you following what I'm saying? Some theologians argue that if Joseph had not spoken that dream, they would not have put him into the prison, sold him over, and then find himself in the house of Potiphar, then from prison, from Potiphar's wife to the prison, and from prison cell into the palace. Some argue. But I disagree. Because God is not one dimensional. He's multi-dimensional. There are many facets to divine purpose. And the interpretation of every course that the Lord defines for a man is not necessarily cast in stone that he has to go that way. They are, that's why even in the course of mandates and direction, he tells Abraham, leave your father, your kin, your family, your nation, and then go to a place I will show you. Does it tell Abraham where to pass? Genesis 12. Does it tell Abraham where to pass? What if Abraham chose instead of going east and he chose to go north? Will he still find the place? Yes. That's what we call prevenient grace. The guiding light that is embedded in Sunesis, that critical faculty of wisdom that directs you to make the right step even when you don't know how you made it because God began that journey by declaring you for that mandate. We will never know everywhere God has called us. We'll never be able to interpret everything, but this is what we know. That if you hear God, I say again, there's a critical faculty. It's, it's, in, it's, it's, in, it's what we call the critical wisdom. The Greek word is sunesis. Critical wisdom that nudges your heart sometimes to a certain direction that you never premeditated, but find that by the grace or prevenient grace of God, it sort of drives you even when you think you're the one driving yourself, but really you are not. Have you ever woken up in the morning and you wanted to meet a person, X called, I want to meet uh, Agatha, for example, her name. I wish I could see her. And then that morning you woke up, something told you, ah, you need to go and buy a wig. Which is unusual. So you go to one mall, the usual place, you buy that wig and you don't find that wig. Then you say, hmm, where can I buy it? And then they tell you, no, there's another place somewhere down there. Right? For you, you're in your head, you think I'm going to buy her wig. And while you're going to that next mall, you find Agatha. Then you're like, ah, Agatha, I've been looking for you. Okay? And some people think actually that the core purpose of that day was to buy a wig. But if you're spiritual, you realize that the core purpose of that day was for you to meet Agatha. The wig was just a by the way. Because even your cousin could lend you one or your mother can buy you. Or there was even a possibility of you wanting to buy a wig and then you went online and found somebody who can deliver at your doorstep. Or even cancel and say, no, I'm not going to do a wig. Or put something on the head. You see what I'm saying? When you continue, when you grow in the things of the Spirit, when such synchronicities start taking place, then you understand the seriousness and the connectedness that your spirit carries with the realm that is not seen. But if the wisdom of God is added to that, it's amazing how many things you can command. 
It's amazing how many things you can command. You'll never stand before a king and not command things for your advantage. You will never meet in individuals by mistake, coincidences, chances, luck. It's amazing. When you are aligned and synchronized to that world, you will not meet your enemies. They can move the earth for 20 years and you have never seen them. You remember that portion of scripture, the Egyptians you see now, you shall see no more. When you are synchronized to that realm, those who hate you, the wicked and unreasonable, God will place far away. You'll find that there are people you never meet. Or if you should meet, you'll meet once in a decade. Even if they drive by you every day. They might even be using the same route back home. I tell, even tell you, but we see that guy every day. Don't you see him? And honestly, whenever you're driving, somehow your eye... When... Am I communicating to somebody here? Now, let's go back to this because there's a point I wanted to give. Joshua did not tell them what God had told him about his place before the Israelites. He stayed on the course of the assignment given to him toward Israel. That in expression for the chosen was wisdom to stay on the course of executing his mandate but not necessarily wasting his time to tell them things they might never even understand or create enmities that he shouldn't create because there is a point in time where that elevation should introduce him right to the hearts of those who should accept him when he's elevated. But he is not patient. He, if, he, if he is not patient for that elevation, he might make unnecessary enemies. Again, I repeat, there was a way of Joseph going to Egypt without necessarily going through prison. Or stirring his brother to the envy of why is he the chosen one. If even his father questioned him, he says, are you saying that I and your mother and your brothers shall bow to you? This even provoked the heart of the man who loved him most. If it disturbed the man who loved him most, Jacob have I loved, and so have I eaten. You understand what I'm saying? You get it? If it can disturb a man, it was very clear, I have loved you, Joseph, more than anybody else. Anybody else. I've given you a coat of many colors. I'm separating you. But the moment the boy starts speaking that dream, Jacob is disturbed. He's like, uh -uh. <laughs> okay, I love you, but when it comes to power, I have issues. But yet you'd expect Joseph to, Jacob to understand more because, because he was preferred above his brother. Isn't it? Esau was older than. But God preferred Jacob above Esau. Scripture says, Jacob have I loved, Esau have I hated. I thought a man of that caliber, by the time he, he has loved one above others, it's not just a natural affection to the son. It's more of a spiritual connection because he sees the preservation of posterity. That's a deep one. Every parent, it doesn't matter how many children you have, you're most attached to the one who can extend your posterity. It's not that you don't love the others more. I mean less, sorry. No, it doesn't mean that you love the others less, English. Or that you love this person more but you find a natural inclination and an attachment, the feeling to spend more time and invest more in the one who you know should preserve your posterity because in the event you are gone, if you're not able, if you were not able to be in the place where you should have instructed, it was important that you left one who would be able to direct and instruct in your stead. So sometimes it's not that you love that child more or that you love them less, but you find yourself inclined by purpose. Jacob should not have been the one to be provoked and disturbed by a child he felt inclined to already and connected to by purpose because he experienced the same grace when he was preferred above his brother. But what was on Joseph could provoke anyone. 
I'm talking to you who think that you'll please the whole world when the favor on your life already stinks offense. Tell your neighbor favor is offensive. There are people who will never love you, not because you're ugly, no, but because the favor on your life. What is in them offends, it is offended. So seek pleasing everybody. Especially when you know your favorite. Prepare yourself. Somebody will look at you and hate you. And you think you have a spirit of rejection. Uh-uh. It's not rejection, dear. It's favor. Some of you spend nights casting out spirits of rejection. <laughs> Yet there will always be more at your side than those that are against you. Where you see rejection, I see favor. First Peter 4.14, message version. If you are abused because of Christ, count yourself fortunate. It is the spirit of God and his what? Glory that what? Brought you to the notice of others. Do you know? Oh, 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 oh. Do you know you can be in the world and nobody knows your name? Do you know how many people are on the... When I was growing up, there's this mad person we saw always passing by home. But we never got to know his name. We just knew. He's a mad fellow. You see him more than you see many people. But you never care to know his name. Why? Because he's not significant to you. But by the time a newspaper thinks to print your name. Good or bad, don't worry. But the fact that it entered an editor's notes. Because some of you, you could live in the shadows of others, the people, the community. But when your name comes out, somebody shout hallelujah. You'll offend. So it's not rejection, it's favor. Tell anybody it's not rejection. It's favor. Ha, I'm going deep. Can I go deeper? Now listen. Faith is an amazing mystery because if it were only up to the words that we speak and the expressions or actions of our faith, supposed faith, quote and unquote, it would be easily weighed and understood or estimated by many. But it's not quite so. If you've been in the faith for some time, you'll realize that not everybody who says, I have defeated it in Jesus' name, really defeats it. Not everybody who says, in Jesus' name, by next year, I will have a car, will drive it. In Jesus' name, by next week, I buy this property, will, will, will buy it. In the name of Jesus, my child, my children are coming, my womb is opening, will have an open womb. Faith has been designed to give that answer. But not everybody who professes this faith will actually supposed what and I put that in quotes faith will actually have the results of the faith that they profess in quotes because not all we call faith is actually faith that is why even in its simplicity it's one of the deepest mysteries to be demystified let me give you a thought and I wish I had time but I don't have the time but let me give you one example to go back home with Jesus is teaching the principles or the laws of faith. And then he brings one of the most ambiguous laws. He calls it childlike faith. Childlike faith. He says that, Matthew 18, 3, he says, Verily I say unto you, except you be converted, 
and become as little children, you shall not enter into the kingdom of God. Unless you're converted. Now, when we talk about childlike, he, he's talking about the conversion. Listen to this word here. The conversion that requires the adult to become childlike, then inherit the realm of God. The word there for kingdom of God is the Greek, the, the Greek word there for kingdom is realm. Eh? Translates as realm. That except you go through some sort of conversion of your spirit that makes you like a little child, you shall not function in the realm of God. I thought all conversions are like upgrades. Isn't it? Most conversions in this instance are designed or are usually predicted to be sort of some upgrades of something, especially if you are being invited into a higher realm. The realm is higher, it's the kingdom. And God says, uh -uh, you should be converted. You'd almost think that there has to be an improved version of yourself to be or to transcend in the realm that is higher than you. But I see a conflict here, this paradox of seeking a realm higher than I, but God says in my conversion, I sort of have to lose some maturity. Some maturity. In my conversion, I must lose the things that I know so I can actually effectively know as I ought. This is deep. Jesus says, Father, I thank you because you have hidden these things from the wise and the prudent and you have revealed them unto babes. Even so, Father, so it seemed good in thy sight. It's a pleasant thing to the Father that he finds a wise and prudent man and he says, uh -uh, this is too deep for your wisdom and prudence. So I must firstly um, convert you and remove what you think you have learned and attained through life as wisdom and prudence. If I can take you back to that version of being babe, then I can actually work with you. What is that that has to debase me to the understanding of a child? And some actually think that it only touches the places of that generic law, uh, uh, downgrade of what we regard as maturity. But it's deeper than that. It's more than just downgrading your maturations. It's more of the consciousness that you lose as you mature because you were never taught to keep it or preserve it while you were still a babe. Let me explain it. Scientists tell you that when a child is born, now listen to this, when a child is born, they are born with more sensory perceptions than adults. Scientists have proved that when a child is born, they pick sounds a normal adult cannot pick. That would simply be like background noise. Not even in any way would your conscience acquaint to such sounds because in growing up, as you started to separate the sounds, you formed language. And in the formation of that language, you got a communication tool. And when you got that language or developed this communication ability, you sort of lost or threw away the other sounds and frequencies because you did not need them, supposedly, for you to function in the realm of intelligent men. Are you following? Yet, by design, you'd ask, if you did not need them, why in the first place were you created with them? Haven't you heard that what you don't grow in a child, the child loses? Don't you know that the first seven years 
when you're raising a child, are very pivotal. Everything you teach that child in the first seven years, usually they don't lose it. And if they lose it in the first seven years, it may be so hard or close to impossible for them to gain it. Oh, have you met a three or four year old child and put them before four or five languages? Do you know they can learn languages in five, six months? Do you know a four year old, a five year old brain can sit before somebody speaking a foreign language in two, three months and they're speaking it fluently? And you'd need to go through, a, you know, a, well-trained professionals to learn a class to sit down to learn Spanish. This child goes around people speaking Spanish. They enter a supermarket, go back home, put on some television for them. In three months, they're fluent. Why? Because at that point, their brain is functioning. It, it picks the frequencies that you're not able to, to pick. It connects to, you know, sensory capabilities that are still developing. They're still in the process of growing. But as you formed the language, then you lost and threw them away. Like I said, those frequencies stay functional, but they're not applicable because they do not resonate with the world and the language that you have developed over the years to survive or exist among intelligible people. Again, I ask, then why were you given those potentials or abilities in the first place? Were they only to be lost until, I mean, held until the time where you were calibrated in the language to function? Or... There are ways God could have used these frequencies if you were oriented right. Are you getting it? Now, if this, this changes the whole understanding of childlike as little children, because then it's no longer about how mature this child is to understand, but the abilities that the toddler or the child has that as an adult, you lose by reason of how the world has oriented you. That is why I have learned by God, and I don't know whether somebody is mature enough to understand this. Sometimes, sometimes you have to get into these things as one who does not know most, who does not know at all because you know so much. And that is why people quite can't understand that juxtaposition between how Paul then places himself as an inheritor, as one first in rank in all things and stuff like that, and above all the apostles. But as he continues to age, he says, mm, ah, I'm least, I'm less of the least of all saints. Oh, why are you degrading yourself? We thought that you're the great apostle. Oh, yes. He laid the foundation that you're building any seed of greatness. That's in the New Testament inheritance. But when he says, and to whom I'm less than the least of all saints, is this grace given me? Paul is not just simply recognizing or building around the, the, the least position he has in rank, but he's trying to help you appreciate that at the point when he understood that what is operating on him cannot only come through credentials and, 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 and intelligence and what he has or has earned or has worked or faithfully lived, but only as grace is given to him that he should preach among the Gentiles these unsearchable riches. It's a place that actually humbles him more. That is why when if you understood Ephesians 3.8, then you'd understand why Paul says, for I know nothing against myself. It's a small thing for you to judge me because I don't judge myself. He says, I don't judge myself for I know nothing by myself. Yet am I not hereby justified, but he that justifieth me is the Lord. Why? Because he understands that to this far, oh, let me speak to people who can understand this. Have you ever found something on your life? Like some of you have made some money who came from very poor families. And you bought a car, built a house, you know, took your children to very nice schools. And then one day you sat back to reflect and said, how did I even land here? If it was hard work, I have a friend who worked hard. If it was education, in the class we had a child who was smarter. There is just nothing that I can really explain or attribute to this success because there are things I see on myself that my qualifications 
quite could not have earned or were not enough to have invited me in such a place. It was only grace given me. You understand? When you understand that, it can become the springboard of your strength to encourage you in the time when you must downtrodden to always remind you, you didn't put yourself there, neither can you sustain yourself there. That is how I know no man, no man can destroy the bigger grace. Because when I look at myself, I don't think that it was my education. I don't think that it was my prayer life. I, it, 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 it was just a choosing of the Lord that one day he looked into my mother's womb and said, this is the vessel I'm going to use to serve my people. When you understand that, you realize that the power that holds you is bigger than your ability even to fast and pray. Not that we fast or we don't fast or don't pray. That's why Paul says, and not hereby am I justified. But because I have a God before whom I judge, who chose me even before I chose myself. Or actually, if he asked me that should I choose you, I would have told him, no, choose a better one. But he still chose you. Who understands what I'm saying? Who understands this? Now, when you understand this, you realize that this did not get on to you when you were 25. It chose you before you developed a brain. It chose you before you learned to walk. It chose you before you joined your primary or your secondary school. It chose you before your teacher gave you your grades and rated you on a report card. It chose you. It pursued you, has pursued you. Some of you even only saw two, three, four classrooms and then you fell out of class and just continued. Naive meritocracy. You see a man, the way he's talking, the way he's acting, you think, why is he wealthy? Because he didn't go to school. Yes, but there's something on him that goes beyond the education and he's now hiring those who are educated. Oh, if you understand it, shout amen. Listen to a simple principle like childlike faith. That I must firstly convert you back to original settings. If I should work with you. That when a man becomes born again. They enter the kingdom as a babe, not as a mature one. So when we talk about the faith of a child. When Jesus was teaching about the faith of a child. He's not only speaking about the loss of your maturations, but rather God inviting you back to the orientations you lost because you were born in a carnal realm. Because you were born in a carnal realm. So this is not only the abandonment of what you know, but also the reawakening of what you no longer know. Not because you didn't know it, but because you put it in the background noise, it was useless and unnecessary. But now it's expedient that it's awakened. And he says, those frequencies, you needed them. I designed them that way. You see, a child, a toddler, or let me just say three, a four-year-old child or a three-year-old, if you gave them keys and told them you're driving today, do you think they would say, I don't know how to drive? You understand? Their brain is not mature enough to understand whether the process it requires to drive a car. So they are built in a faith that they can out of the ignorance of the process. And as much as it's not right to give that child that car, but God says there's something you lost and it would be important if you matured because there are things you shouldn't have known. They were not designed for your knowing. 
and I have to convert you back not to know them if I should work with you in faith. Do you get what I'm saying? The only way Jesus would live a life without sin was by not knowing it. If he knew it, he would sin. That's what the Bible says. He, 2 Corinthians 5, 2 Corinthians 5, 21, for he hath made him to be sin who knew not sin. If Christ knew sin, he would sin. The only way for God to keep him, preserve him, was in the place of denying him the knowledge of it. And that's what really kept the purity of the Christ. That if you walk, if he walked to the Father and asked, what is sin? The Father would say, this is not what you should know in the flesh. That does not presuppose that in the spirit he did not know sin. In the spirit he knew sin. In fact, if somebody just cut the clip before, they would say, ha, heresy, heresy. This brother is saying that Jesus didn't know about, no, 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 no. In the spirit he knew sin and the consequence of sin, but as a man, the only way he could be kept from sin was not to know. That is why a two-year-old child can walk naked. Because they don't understand the Adamic scene. They, they don't, they're not yet awakened to, 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 to what it means. See, they walk and run naked. You try it. So this is not the thing that makes you undress yourself because you need to become a child. No. There are things you lost and you had to lose them. When I was a child, I stood as a child. I spoke as a child. I understood as a child. But when I, was, I matured, I threw away childish things. But they are, I'm saying, I'm simply saying, there are things we were not supposed to throw away. And God says, in this conversion, when I'm building faith, those things are reignited. They are reawakened for a man to function effectively in faith. But because they are too wise and prudent, we can't work. Let me look for a babe. Let me give you that last sentence or that last example you'll understand. When I was working in, in uh, one of the hospitals, I worked in two hospitals before. I joined my bank, the, bank I, the banks I worked at. Somebody has been living, say, with uh, a disease, a killer disease, for years. And then they walk into the hospital, not even sick of it. But one day they come for a routine check and they're diagnosed with a disease. And once you tell them you're suffering from, say, HIV, they break, they crumble. Then you cancel them and tell them, you know, we're going to go through some counseling. Can you return next month? They come back next month and their skin and bone. In four weeks, their body has been malnourished. Not because of the virus, but because of what has happened here. If they had not gone to the doctor that month, they would have looked differently than after one month. But because the doctor made them know, opened their mind to know. Are you following what I'm saying? the knowledge of it would kill them. But when a man matures to a place of being told that this is in your body and they are informed of it but their spirit does not know it. I'm not talking about their mind here. Their spirit does not know it. That's the beginning. That's the first step of faith. Now, the body might start exhibiting the symptoms. That is why we tell somebody, ah, that's why doctors exist. 
But if you study the core conviction of medicine, it's really to assist, it's designed. All medicine is assisted, it is designed to assist nature. You understand? If they say we have no cure of this, it means there is nothing that can assist your body to fight this. But really, no, no medicine can fight alone without the help of your body. Because if you don't have blood that pumps, I mean that moves, if a heart that pumps, even if they administer medicine in there, but the blood won't carry it, you can't heal. So really, medicine is designed to assist the natural process. The natural process. This body. You see what I'm saying? Are you following what I'm saying? So, if somebody has those symptoms, we can tell them, okay? It's okay and important for you to treat your symptoms while you're praying. You know, there are these pastors who also are funny. They tell this pastor, go off drugs. No. They can assist the body while the person is believing God. When they heal, they go off the treatment. Common sense. You understand? Because some, in believing, they might die before the, the faith was. <laughs> but it doesn't matter how much medication you put in that body. If you don't have faith, you can still die. You get my point? That is why doctors tell a person, you'll be okay. And the person just, they just cling on the word of the doctor. Not necessarily that the person is okay, but the doctor said, to me, hey, the doctor told me everything will be okay. And they believe it. If the doctor tells them, you're dying of cancer. I've seen people, they tell them, you're dying of cancer. And they, already, they write their will, everything. They, they, then they take them to India and they tell them, no, it's not cancer. And they heal immediately. The machine found something else. The knowledge of a thing. The knowledge of a thing. So when you mature in this, you realize the consciousness that you have to develop and the things that you have to reawaken already designed, given to human beings to carry. And when you learn the way of faith, sometimes you lose some wisdoms and prudences and go back to babe mode to function in the faith God has designed you to function in. Only the mature can understand this. Yet they are babes. They had to become babes to understand this. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding, your own wisdom. In your understanding, HIV is incurable. In your understanding. But by the word of God, it's curable. Ah, uh, pastor. Even me, I'm saying, ah, uh, you... With God, all things are possible. In this ministry, we have HIV negative people who are positive. They're not on drugs, and every time we take them to hospital, they are testing negative. It's possible. We have people here who had stage four cancers who are walking alive. Are you following what I'm saying? With God, all things are possible. Now I have a few minutes to finish. It might look stupid, but it's telling Joshua, I'm going to open that sea. I'm going to part it. But wait to, to the water, go to the river bank, and stand there, let the anointed lead the group. All I need is if their feet touch the edge of the river. I will part it. The moment their feet touch the water, the flow of the water will be cut off upstream and the river will stand up like a wall. But the feet must that first stay. <laughs> now you have people who are who are going to walk before that 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 river, Father, in Jesus' name. 
Let this river part. Now see, it has not worked. Why? Because they move by physical evidence. And God says, here is the wisdom. There are things that will never work until you put that foot next to the water. And the moment it touches the water, it will part. You didn't get it. Let me explain. You want to build a house. You will never get the money until you go to a hardware and buy one bag of cement. One bag. Then you put it on the ground. That's when you'll see money coming. In a, I, listen, I have a sermon one day I will preach. I've not, I, I'm, I'm just gaining enough time and words. But I've given some of you a clue. I remember one time my father sat me down and told me, but my son, do you have an enslaved spirit on you? You look like a slave. And it sunk on, it sunk actually. You know, there are people who are working 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. jobs, but they have a spirit of slavery on them. If I had time, I could teach about it and prove it. Because everything the Egyptian went through under Pharaoh, you're leaving it, except that you have a tie and you enter a bank every morning and sit before a till. But everything Pharaoh went through, went through, you're going through. Except that the Egyptian had, uh, no, the, the Israelite uh, was under a different setting. But if you see the consequences, if you read your scripture, the consequence, especially if you're the kind who with all your labor, you can only manage just to buy yourself food and pay your rent. You're under the spirit of slavery. Because what's different between you and the Egyptian, the, the Jew under the Egyptian, they worked and ate watermelon and leeks and fish and they had a place to sleep. What's the difference? You get it? I wish I had time to teach about it, but I don't have time. This, there, I can show you cues in the scripture that can prove to you that some of you are working in some of the highest offices, but you carry that spirit that enslaved the Jew in Egypt. My father one time said it to me. He was a prophetic man. When he said it, the vision came. I knew what the man went, meant. Six years, nothing in my name. But I'm banking every day. I'm putting on ties and shirts. And people look at me and say, wow, this guy's a banker. Wow. Some women were even dreaming to marry bankers. Whoa. <laughs> marry a slave. <laughs> Listen. Listen. I went to God and I asked him, I asked him questions on wealth. I wanted to build wealth the godly way because there are many ways you can build wealth. But I, I knew the Bible was clear that we shall build wealth. It was very clear that it is the blessing of Lord that the Lord that maketh rich and addeth no sorrow. He gives us power, he says, to make wealth that he might establish the covenant that he made with our fathers. So I ask God ultimately a question, God. I see wealthy people and there are many ways people can build wealth, but I want to build wealth your way. And then the Lord began to teach me, and teach me, and teach me, and teach me, and teach me. The moment I understood this, I'll preach it one day, but it would require a whole hour because I want to show you principle and pattern, principle and pattern on building godly wealth, right? Then, after helping me understand this for a couple of months, he now told me, make your first step. I went on my account, and I looked at the account, I laughed at it, I went on Ginger Road, entered that Ninian shop, looked at every electronic, and I saw a small-sized microwave, an LG. I had enough money for it. It was 370,000 shillings then. 370, I believe, or something like that. Very small. 
paid for it. We used to sleep in the boys' quarters, me opposite my brother. I got that microwave. I put it in the corner. I said, God, this is my first step. This is the proof that everything I need in this world I will buy. Eh? 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 Every evening I came back into the house before I slept, I used to walk to my microwave and I would tell it, we are going places. We are going to build four, five, six level buildings. I sleep. Next day, I come to my microwave. The best cars, Mercedes Benzes, we are driving it. The Range Rovers, we are driving them. Me and you, you're my point of contact. I spoke to the microwave. And I spoke to the microwave. And I spoke to the microwave. With the microwave. You understand? But it was my step of faith. There is oh my God. If it's cars, I drive the best. I mean, God has done me so good. 2024, I still have my LG microwave. It's in the deepest part of my office. There. Sometimes when I'm overwhelmed, I go back and I say, ha, ha, ha. We come from far. <laughs> Tell your neighbor, you just need to make one step of faith. Maybe it is the time you went to buy a gown before even a man proposed to you. Maybe this is a time for you to sit in a car and start looking around land asking how much it costs even when your landlord called you last week because he wants money. There was a lady I found back in those first years when I understood this principle. She was called Barbara. Sister to a young lady called Betty. Among the first disciples I had, Barbara was barren. She wasn't having children. She came to me and says, Apostle, I prayed five, six years, seven years, I want a child. I told Barbara, first step, what do you want? Do you want a boy or a girl? She says, boy, let's go buy clothes. Come on now. Let's go buy what? Clothes, first step. We bought blue clothes. Few months from the time we bought those clothes, Barbara calls me, Apostle, I'm pregnant, I'm pregnant. Hallelujah. Uh, the boy came. Hallelujah. What are you talking about? That is why the Bible finds a barren woman and says, first step. Sing, oh barren woman. Who got it? Yeah, that's what the Bible says. He says, sing, first step, oh barren woman. Ask your neighbor, what's your expression of faith? What is your first step to live renting? What is your first step to buy the car? What is your first step to have those children? What is your first step to go to school? What is the first step? My Billy, I dream to go to America. Hey, go, 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 go to the immigration website and read about it. Prepare your paperwork. Tell God we are going. We are going in the mighty name of Jesus. Hey, I can give out anything in this world, but not that microwave. Mm -mm, you're joking. I can give out anything in this world, but not that microwave. Because it's the beginning of my strength. Every time I look at it, I realize that with God, all things are. God does not despise humble beginnings. But you have to step. Some things will never move. Some things will never move. They will never move until you take that first step. We have gone on lands and stood and confessed them, received them even before we had the money. And the next time they bring it to you and you have the money to buy it. By the time you went there, you only had shoes and clothes on your body. But it was the first step of taking over. Are you following what I'm saying? 
before we were preaching before cameras we went before the mirrors you open your bible alone when nobody's watching you open jeremiah and you start preaching i'm telling you i'm telling you you're even sweating before the, the, the oh my god you're sweating before the mirror after that you bathe and put on your shoes and go to town and they find you walking like you have no destiny but oh my god oh my god something has begun it's about to be translated so take the first step Take the first step. Take the first step. God will sort the rest, but at least show us the first day I got my job. I woke up in the morning to go down a few, a few meters away from my home to read in the newspapers whether there was a job advertisement that I could apply for. In the middle of it, one Julian Nyamahunge finds me and says, Paul's son, what are you doing here? He says, I'm, I, I told her, I'm going down with her. I said, there's something I'm going to do down there. She asked me, do you have a job? On the road. Come on now. I told her, uh, no. Tomorrow morning, come and work. That's how I got a job. I had to take that, come on. So, that's why some of you, God will find you on the road. He, he will find you en route going one way and he'll direct you the way you're supposed to go. But begin with that first When God told Abraham, go to a place I'll show you, he didn't know anywhere. In Hebrews, the Bible says he knew not. He says by faith, Hebrews 11 verse 8, when he was called to go into a place which he should receive after for an inheritance, he obeyed and went out not knowing whither he went. Sometimes some inheritances carry no roadmap. They don't carry a GPRS system. You just go. And some of us have met such great inheritances because we made the step of going places we didn't know, but we made that first. Tell your neighbor, make your first step. Whatever you believe in God for. If it's not yet manifesting, you make the second and point back at the first. You make the third and believe in the power that made you take the first step. That is why I tell people, nothing nothing strengthens me like that microwave i don't look at the cars i have or anything i have in this world and i'm like yeah no i look at that microwave and i see the power that lifted me from that boy's court and i know with god all things are possible i can never be broke i can never be broke tell your neighbor i can never be broke <laughs> let's get to our feet i want to pray with you glory to god Glory to God, glory to God, glory to God, glory to God, glory to God. Woo. The world is in danger with you because of what you're going to do. If you want to buy land, start looking in the newspapers. Look, make brokers your friends. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Glory to God. There was a time we bought chairs before even the members had come. Bishop Nathan, there was a time we could buy extra chairs because it was the only way to prove to God that we have made that step. You buy extra chairs and say, Father, they will fill them. Look around and see. Do you understand what I'm saying? But you take that first step. Open your mouth and let's thank God. Open your mouth and let's thank God. While you wait, she said, she no no la. She ne unya. Okuvo to bange mukama umukono gongula be ichu ichi se chinondola ichi ichi tanganye la kuwa ichi se choche ne pula chintu seka. Oh, 
Take a few minutes and talk to God. Let's sing one more time. Why you she said you don't know she said she don't can you raise your hands as an act of faith just as an act of an agreement prayer heavenly father we thank you for the faith that comes this evening that's going to build the impossible, the undoable. We bless you that every man and woman at the sound of my voice connects to the seed of greatness to do things that are going to change and shake their generation. That the first step of faith is burst through this word. And whatever they make, wherever they make that step, and whatever, in whatever they make that step, I decree and I declare that the power is available to fulfill. I also sense in my spirit that there are people here who are receiving an anointing for the miraculous. In about five seconds, I see God himself touch you wherever you are. It's just a miraculous faculty. It's a creative thing. On your life, you're going to create impossible things. Receive it right now in the mighty name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. If you're there and you've never given your life to Christ, this is the opportunity I want to give you. Walk here right now and I pray with you. If you're there and you say, today I want to receive Jesus as my Lord and Savior, I want to be born again as the rest of us say, Amen. If you're there and you say, Pastor, I want to receive my life. I, mean, I, want, to, I want to give my life to Jesus Christ. I want to receive him as my Lord and Savior. Today, I want to make that decision to cross from the kingdom of darkness into the marvelous light of God. Please come right now and I pray with you and we'll close the service. Come wherever you are. By the way, tomorrow we're not going to have evening prayer because we'll be at the ground setting and we need hands, you know? Ladies, you can come and help set up. Those of you who have time, you are welcome to help set up. Come if you want to be born again. Come, 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 come quickly. We want to go home. Some people live very far. For God so loved the world. Come, come, come. That he came. His only Son, whosoever will not pay. Hurry, hurry, hurry. We want to go home. Hurry. Oh, Lord, for God so loved the world. Hurry. So loved the world.
is the best decision you're going to make for your life. Come on, let's celebrate Jesus. Best decision. Best decision. Your life is never going to be the same again. It's never going to be the same again. Let me wait for that brother with a cape to come. Wow, 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 wow. Isn't this amazing? Thank you, Jesus. So those of you who are here, help that young lady. I see the power of God over her already. Say, Lord Jesus, I thank you because you died for my sins and you were raised for my glory. Today, I receive you as my Lord and Savior. I'm born again. Amen. Even those who have made their prayers on the live streaming centers, 607 of them are streaming this evening. We have, we, we see you in Gayaza, we see you in Barara, we see you in Kajansi. Come on, let's pray for them. Father, in the name of Jesus, this that you begin, only you can sustain. You began this work. You see to accomplishment to the glory of Christ. Preserve them, deliver them, heal them. Work in their lives. And I pray for a special grace to set on your lives in the name of Jesus. I see that the power of God is going to transform and change your journey. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. You're going to walk there. I want to take your names and numbers. I want to pray for you follow you up and remind you always on what it means to be born again. Uh, I'm going to ask Pastor uh, Sam to attend to that gentleman with the cape. The rest of you, you can go there. See you on Saturday and Sunday. Oh, my soul, I worship his holy name. This broadcast was brought to you by Fenero Ministries International. For more information, please visit our website at www.fenero.org or download the Fenero app to stay up to date with all the ministry programs. The Fenero app is available on both Google Play and Apple App Store. Join our online family, spread the love and follow us on Instagram, Facebook and also subscribe to our YouTube channel. Panero, make manifest.